monitoring versus uh, SIM in-house solutions. Um, give you a little bit of, of my background. I've been in IT for a little over 30 years. Started in uh, software development programming. Uh, got into networking. From networking, got into security. I've been specializing in security and event analysis since 2003. Okay. So the thing we're going to be talking about is the problem of finding events. So uh, from the annual Verizon Data Breach Report, they found that when they did forensics investigations of incidents, they found that more than 90% of the time, the data about the incident was available in the logs, but proactive discovery via log analysis occurred less than 5% of the time. So in other words, we as an industry are consistently failing to find the needle in the haystack. So <clears throat> in addition to log monitoring, my company has a forensics investigation service. Uh, this is an actual event uh, that we saw last year in a kind of household name organization. <clears throat> when we did uh, the investigation, what we found is it started when one of their users received a phishing email. Uh, against all good security practices, they clicked on the link. Um, as a result, their PC was infected with malware. The attackers downloaded uh, a, an exploit kit and were able to get complete remote control access to that PC. At that point, they looked around the network and found other susceptible systems, spread the infection peer-to-peer -peer within the environment. Um, after that, they started looking at what was on the PCs and the accessible network shares. In the course of doing that, they found a Word document, and this isn't the actual title, but it's pretty close, how to perform an ACH wire, ACH wire transfer. So at that point, they found out who was authorized to perform various uh, financial functions within the organization, use key loggers to get the credentials for those users, and then following the procedure document, went through it step by step, logged in as one user, um, kicked off a wire transfer, logged in as a separate user, authorized that wire transfer, and a substantial portion of this organization's uh, disposable funds disappeared into an Eastern European bank, from there to another bank, never to be seen again. So it's kind of a good news, bad news situation. The good news is this wasn't instantaneous. Uh, it was more than two months from that initial malware infection to the actual finan financial damage that resulted from it. Um, but on the bad, bad news side, um, at no point did the network or the PCs run funny. You couldn't tell operationally that this was happening. They only found out about it when they saw that their uh, bank account had been drained. Okay. So without visibility to what was happening in their network, uh, they had no ability to avoid the damage that resulted from this. There we go. So I'm getting some lag problems. Excuse me a second. There we go. So I'm going to go back to the analogy of finding a needle in a haystack. Uh, from the first slide. It's actually a little bit more difficult than that because what we have is multiple haystacks. Uh, we've got um, network intrusion data, we've got uh, user ID data, vulnerability data, uh, threat intel, uh, and little bits of the needle are hiding all over the place. What we need to do is assemble those pieces together to see what's going on, and we need to do it in near real time. Uh, the goal here is, you know, we're, we're not going to avoid that initial malware infection, what we can avoid is the financial or legal or reputational damage that results from it. Okay. Of course, what I've been talking about is the security goals we're looking to achieve. There is another reason we're doing all this stuff, which is we have a variety of regulatory and legal and audit requirements to meet. We have some options for meeting those goals. We can uh, buy and install a SIM product, run it ourselves. We can hire a managed security service provider, essentially outsourcing it. Or there's kind of a blended model. I can buy a product and hire somebody to run it for me. Okay? Um, I can see you know, good arguments for either of the first two approach. I'm going to make a pretty strong case off the, off the bat that the third option there, uh, I've not seen to be a, a, a successful option. There's some reasons for that. If we think about a provider managed SIM, first off, I want to be clear. I'm not talking about a managed service provider that's using a commercial product as the core. I'm talking about you've bought and owned uh, a SIM product, and now you're hiring essentially a consulting organization to run it for you. Okay? So some advantages in that, <clears throat> any investment I've already made in the SIM product is retained. Um, any tuning that I've already done, obviously, is retained. Also, what my staff learned from going through the exercise is retained. But there are some important disadvantages. 
Um, the whole idea of the MSSP market is based on economies of scale. I got physical infrastructure, engineering staff, operation staff. Um, all these are kind of shared pools of employees. If I do a um, provider managed sim, I really don't get that. What I get is essentially a, a staffing approach. Um, also, all of the costs associated with the SIM software product, the fact that it's replicated customer to customer, I need separate physical infrastructure, I need to maintain it, update it, all of that. Um, and what we see is this type of solution tends to be delivered with very inconsistent quality. And the reason for that is it's not done as a true managed service. Uh, I actually, in a previous life, um, ran a network consulting organization. This is something that's handled as an outsourcing um, consulting deal. So whether it's on customer premise or at the back end at the provider, you're essentially assigning a person or a couple of people to run this infrastructure, which means you have all the same costs and turnover risks and things like that that uh, an end customer would have if they did it internally, but you also have the added cost structure of the consulting organization. So essentially it's the same method you would do if you did a SIM internally with added cost. Okay which is why I typically recommend against it. Um, so I'm going to go to the two, what I would say is, is kind of more uh, effective ways of doing this. Own, buying and owning a SIM product yourself or, uh, or um, hiring a managed service provider. On the customer managed SIM side, uh, there's some things I have to do. I have to install it, configure it, and maintain it. Uh, but I also need to tune my intrusion detection systems. I need to create custom SIM correlation rules. Uh, a good SIM is going to come with anywhere from a couple of hundred to a couple thousand predefined uh, correlation rules. The thing is, those are best practice recommendations. They're not really uh, specific to that environment. If you really want it to be effective, you have to tune it uh, with, with at least hundreds of correlation rules specific to that environment and the security goals for your organization. You have to train your analysts how to use the system. What's important, what isn't, what do they do when they see events? The SIM vendor will come out with a major release typically every three years. So I need to reinstall that, repurchase it. And the environment itself changes. So I have new equipment, uh, new employees, um, goals of the organization change. Also the outside threat landscape changes. So I need to make changes to in order to uh, update and support that. Challenges in achieving these goals. This is big complex software with many thousands of tuning options. Therefore, it's expensive software. On top of that, because of that complexity, there's a lot involved in configuring it. Once I'm doing it, all I see is what's inside my environment. So we usually recommend for organizations that do this internally uh, that they hire um, a uh, uh, network intelligence, uh, security intelligence service in order to provide them input on you know, what other people are seeing, the new events that are coming. It's hard to stay focused on the task. There are some environments where we see you know, security events every day, but for most customer environments, these are rare, fairly rare events. Uh, you, know, uh, you might see a, a mild uh, virus or malware outbreak that doesn't have any real significance on a regular basis, but serious security incidents um, are pretty rare events. And so your analysts are doing a lot of fishing, but not catching many fish. So it's hard to stay focused on the task. It's hard to come up with a coverage model. This is a 24 by 7 problem. Most organizations that I see doing this internally usually use uh, kind of a modified 8 by 5 model where they're uh, monitoring it during the business day but then doing some kind of pager-based uh, approach off hours. Uh, the problem is that tends to burn out your staff. There's a real problem with false positives. It's difficult to tune these systems to be accurate enough so that they're alerting you when something important is happening, but not generating a lot of false alarms when it isn't. I actually have a slide talking about this issue in more detail. It's hard to retain personnel. The work of the base analyst is really unrewarding work. They're looking at logs every day, fairly rarely seeing anything real. Um, and within two years of starting that job, they're worth anywhere from 25% to 50% more than they were when you hired them. So if they leave after a year and a half to two years, they can get a lot more money and typically be uh, move into a role where they have much more interesting work. So what we see is there's a real revolving door uh, for these base level analysts. By the way, a great way to get into the industry. As a result of these problems, what we see is owning and maintaining a SIM over time winds up being a much more difficult problem than it appeared at first. Part of the issue is when we think about the problems we're trying to solve, it isn't just one thing we're trying to do. On the one hand, we have log management which I like to think of as just you know, getting logs and putting them in a safe place. On the other hand, we have log monitoring, which is analysis. OK, 
Okay. On the log management side, all I need to do is capture the data, store it securely, be able to search it and report on it. On the log monitoring side, I need to correlate the data across all the different sources, analyze the resulting data, and provide timely intelligent alerting. In other words, I need the system to be smart enough to ring a bell when something bad is happening, but not when it isn't. Okay? The problem on the left, log management, it's pretty easy to get a piece of software or an appliance to be smart enough to solve that problem, right? to, to meet that goal. The problem on the, on the right, log monitoring, um, I've yet to see like a self-learning system that does this. It's really human tuning that does it, and it's a big upfront task and a lot of ongoing maintenance. Um, so as you look at the overall solution, you need to keep these two different goals in mind, and they often lead uh, in different directions. So some additional pros and cons of looking at a SIM. Um, advantages of a SIM, it gives me maximum internal control. My staff learns a lot from doing it. And once I hire people to do it, I can use them for other things as well. Some disadvantages, it's expensive to go out and hire a bunch of people. And when they show up, they tend to want things like training and development. I need more senior people to design the systems they use, to manage them, to act as points of escalation. Uh, and again, as I mentioned before, we, we tend to see high turnover in those base analyst positions. Top of that, limited view. If I'm, all I'm seeing is what's happening in my environment, I'm not seeing a lot of high security events. Um, as a result, I'm not getting a lot of practice at recognizing them and knowing what to do about them. So it's hard to keep the skills sharp. Because I'm not seeing a lot of events, it's hard to stay focused on the task. This is one of the real issues that I see when I go out to customers that are having security problems with, with monitoring, is that often they've built a monitoring infrastructure, they've hired some people, but the value you get from a security analyst on any given day is a theoretical value, like a potential value, not an actual value. It's kind of like insurance on the day your house doesn't burn down. right? So what we see often is organizations have um, IT projects that are tightly uh, related to their profitability, their success in the marketplace. And if you know your places are like places I've worked, they're understaffed and behind schedule. It's easy to borrow the analysts from the looking at a screen job to helping to work on an IT project. When that happens, suddenly they're going from a potential benefit to a real measurable benefit to the organization, and the analyst himself is getting more interesting work. And so what we see over time is they spend more and more time on these production tasks and less and less time looking at the screens. And that creates a potential political problem. The security management has asked for and gotten the money to solve a business problem, spent the money, but not solved the problem. On top of that, there's no fallback position. When I buy a SIM, I've got the software price, I've got the hardware platform that I need to run it on, including storage, I've got to hire the people and train them, often there's some upfront consulting. I put all my chips on the table. Now if it works out great, that's great. But if I get a year or two into it and I find it, it, that I'm having significant problems, I can't get that investment back. Okay, so it's really hard to change directions. I'll talk more about that on a later slide. Uh, any questions to this point? So I'm going to go back to that problem of false positives. With any complex alerting system, whether it's an IDS or a SIM, I kind of have two choices in tuning. I can tune it tight where I don't get a lot of false positives, but I raise the risk that I'm going to miss real events. Or I can tune it loose where I raise my confidence I'm going to catch all the real events, but at the cost of having a lot of false positives to wade through. So the danger of missing real events is obvious. What I'm going to talk about here is the problem of false positives. So if I tune my system loose and I'm getting a lot of false positives, the first problem I'm going to run into is I'm burning staff time. They're spending a lot of time looking at things that wind up being nothing. But if I bury them under a, a, you know, a heavy load of false positives, I get beyond that, and now they've got to wade through those to get to the real event. So my time to detection goes up. And if I bury them deep enough, they reach a point of frustration where they just kind of find other things to do with their time. They give up. If that happens, when I finally do get a big serious event, nobody's watching the screens anymore. So it doesn't get caught. And it's even worse than that because I've just spent money and time to build a system that creates a smoking gun record where anybody can come in afterwards and second guess me and say, what do you mean you missed the event? Here's this log right here that shows exactly what it was, what you should have done, and you missed it. And it's not a valid excuse to say, yeah, it's right there with 100,000 other ones I didn't get to. 
So I've been banging on Sims pretty hard. Um, I want to make the point now that at no point am I saying they don't do what they say they do. The best of them have excellent analysis and correlation features. The things I'm talking about are operational problems. At the same time, there are some times when SIM is the only option. So some organizations can't let the data out. If I'm you know, the Army or the Navy, I can't hire somebody else to look at my logs. I have to do it internally. Right? Similarly, if I'm the CIA or the NSA, I can't hire a third party a private company to do that work for me. Nuclear power plants. We do a lot with um, civilian power, um, you know, coal, gas, uh, hydro. Nuclear plants do their security internally. Sites that don't have internet connectivity. The MSSP paradigm is based on external access to the data. If you're not internet connected, you have to find another way to solve a security issue. So when that is the case, when you have to do it internally, what I've seen over the years is some commonalities in organizations that have made it work. First and most important, dedicated staff. I need a SIM guy. Okay? This is a big, complex project. A lot of effort, a lot of knowledge required. Um, if a person takes that on as another task in the 50 other things they were assigned to do, that is a recipe for failure. This is a big, difficult project. You need to really uh, have somebody dedicated to it. Beyond that, though, you need more than one person assigned. You need SIM guys. And the reason I'm saying that is, I talked earlier about a paradigm how the analysts you know, become worth more and then leave. A similar thing happens with the SIM engineer, the person who does the, the complex tuning. The job of tuning a SIM uh, takes as little as a year, as much as more than two years, depending on size and complexity of the environment. And the time spent doing that is a really interesting and challenging project. The person doing it learns a lot from the, the process of doing it. Typically, they'll add a certification or two in the course of doing it. Um, and at the end of that project, let's say it's a year and a half in and they finally got it fully tuned. Now the job changes to, okay, sit there for 10 years and run it. Okay? It's not an interesting job. There's no career path associated with it. And the person has now added skills that makes them worth anywhere from twenty-five dollars to $50,000 a year more than they were worth when they started the project. And if they leave, they can get much more interesting work. So what we see is almost the minute the SIM is tuned, the person who is primarily responsible for it leaves the organization. If that happens and they're the only person assigned, all the knowledge of the implementation leaves with them. You need a second person assigned for knowledge transfer. So at the very least, you can bring in a replacement person and do knowledge transfer with the, set, the backup before they leave. Um, so we really see you need to have two people assigned to this, again, for that shared pool of knowledge. Also, this is a big, expensive project that requires cooperation from different departments in the organization. If senior management isn't on board, there's no way it's going to be successful in the long term. Finally, the team that's actually running this internally, they need help. They need uh, access to outside intel, what's, what's coming, what's new and different in the security world. If there's a major incident, they need access to high-end uh, forensic services. It's not really fair to have them climb out on a limb and hand them a saw. Okay? They need access to more services and help. So if SIMs have all these problems, why can an MSSP do it better? And the answer is we have some inherent advantages. First and most important, specialization of roles. When you're the inside SIM guy, you need to know all the aspects of how it works, all the supporting technologies. Um, with an MSSP, we have pools of people assigned to the different tasks. We have people whose only job is to do the initial tuning, whose only job is to do the initial you know, first tier uh, analysis of events, whose only job is to know the reporting systems, uh, IDSs, firewalls, server operating systems that are generating the data. Economies of scale. We're using a shared physical infrastructure, engineering staff, analysts, global intel. Broader visibility. We're looking at literally thousands of clients' data from around the world. And so uh, for a given customer, the odds that they're going to be the first one to see an event is, is pretty low. So they're going to benefit from the people who did see it first. Um, the MSSP staff has learned what it is, how to recognize it, how to respond to it. So you benefit from the experience that the MSSP analysts gain from, from seeing it somewhere else first. Focus. If I work for Acme Widget Company, our job is to make widgets. Security is a cost on top of that. It's easy to get pulled off of the security uh, focus based on things uh, related to the productive uh, job of the company. 
With an MSSP, this is the only job we have. There's not some other task to be drawn off to. Scalability. Every now and then there's a real major event. Uh, the most recent really big one that I can think of is Heartbleed. Um, with an internal staff, I've got you know one, two, three people in the security team. Um, it's hard to amass a big effort to research it, respond to it. Um, with our organization, we were able to put a task force of over 40 engineers together to research what everybody was seeing around the world, to coordinate uh, communication with our customers, to help them to, you know, to disseminate that information. Um, and so that ability to scale up, to have a pool of engineers and analysts that you can apply to an emergency situation. Rapid implementation. I mentioned before, uh, typically we see a year to more than two years for implementation of a SIM. Uh, if it's done well, an MSSP can be implemented in as little as 45 to 60 days. Typically, it's more like 90 days. Um, again, co contrast that to a year to more than two years for a SIM project. So if you are in a hurry to meet a security or compliance goal, the MSSP approach has uh, significant advantages. And then finally, knowledge transfer to internal staff. When I talked about the advantages of a SIM, one of the things I mentioned is what the internal staff learns from doing it, and that's true. But I'm going to make the, the countervailing argument here to say that when you use an MSSP, the internal staff has access to that pool of knowledge in the MSSP. They're seeing thousands of events from thousands of customers every day. So the access to call them and ask for advice, ask for uh, you know, their experience, what they're seeing, uh, is a huge advantage of the MSSP model. So, getting to the thing most management people want to talk about, costs. Uh, this is an actual analysis that we did for a customer. To give you an idea of scale, this was about a 15,000 person organization. And uh, they were looking at a SIM purchase, uh, did all the uh, uh, due diligence. They found that between the SIM product itself, uh, the uh, processing hardware and storage, they were going to do some uh, consulting for the initial setup. Uh, computers for the two people they were planning to hire to run the system for them, um, some training. Uh, it was about $930,000 in initial startup costs. Uh, on the MSSP side, about $20,000 in equipment and setup costs. So very big difference on that initial side. On the ongoing costs, um, on the SIM side, we had an engineer and kind of a mid-tier analyst. Um, some management costs. Uh, security engineering costs, they were planning to hire a forensics company to give them intel and to be available as a forensics uh, assistance if they uh, had a major incident. That was a five-year, $40,000 uh, contract, so it's shown here as $8,000 a year. Um, maintenance and support contracts, uh, depreciation and amortization for the upfront purchase, so we get to about $630,000 in annual recurring costs. On the MSSP side, this is where the real cost is, the, the actual monitoring charges. There was about $565,000. Uh, so we see you know, some, some lower costs there. Comment about this. This is not really an apples to apples comparison. The MSSP is a true 24 by seven monitoring option. If they were doing it internally, they were gonna do a modified eight by five approach. Two employees monitoring during the business day, shared pager at nights and weekends and holidays. So the question is, you know, how much real coverage do you have uh, in that and how much kind of staff burnout do you experience? This is one way of looking at costs. I think there's a better way. Think of it from a standpoint of cash flow. So the red line uh, is the MSSP. I have a, a tiny initial buy-in and then a little blip every three years when I replace the collector equipment. But mostly I have a linear cost, right? It's the annual uh, monitoring fee. The blue line represents the SIM costs. I have this huge initial buy-in. I buy the software, I buy the hardware, I hire the people, I do some training and consulting. Um, and then I get very low costs in years two and three because all I have really is my maintenance contracts, my depreciation, and, and uh, my employees. Then at the end of year three, I have to do a refresh. I, I buy the new version of the software. Um, I uh, typically do some consulting and training to do that transition. So you see the sawtooth-like effect. A huge initial buy-in, two years cheap, a bump up, two years cheap, a bump up. Two points about this. One is, I carried this uh, line out 10 years. At no point did I ever get to where um, less money was spent for the SIM than for the MSSP. You never make up that initial buy-in. The other thing is, again, the no fallback issue. 
that initial buy-in, you put all your chips on the table. If it doesn't work, if you find in years two and three that this is just not working for you, there's no way to go back and get that investment back. So I'm going to talk more about that on this next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, one more here. So this is a 15,000 person company. Uh, a lot of us aren't in 15,000 person companies. So if you get to a much smaller organization, let's say in the you know two to 3,000 employees range, that difference gets even bigger because there are certain uh, kind of fixed costs of the MSSP. You can't have less than one employee, okay? So what we find is that difference is even greater. So talking about no fallback position. Uh, actually, uh, reading economics books is kind of a hobby of mine. Shows what a geek I am. Uh, and in economics, what they say is sunk costs are irrelevant. The money I've already spent doesn't matter. All that I should look at is where am I now, where do I want to get, and what's the most cost-effective way to get there. Of course, we don't live in the world of traditional economics. We live in the real world. And there what we find is money that you've already spent reflects your judgment, right? If you've asked for and gotten a half million dollars and spent it, it's really tough to come back and say, remember that half million dollars you gave me? Yeah, we flushed that away. I want another you know, 200,000 to go in a different direction. Not a career building move, okay? So the result of that is once you've bought a SIM, it's really hard to move away from it, even if it's not working. So I'm going to go back to the idea of a provider managed SIM. I own the SIM, but I've hired an outside consultant to run it for me. Uh, to just refresh the advantages of that, where it retains my investment, retains what I've learned, uh, retains the staff value. Disadvantage, it doesn't achieve the MSSP uh, economies of scale. But what we see is when organizations do this, what really happens is they bought the, MS, the, the SIM with the plan of doing it internally and found that they ran into all the operational issues I was talking about. And so now they're trying to kind of hide the fact that that happened. Um, so what I say here is try to avoid or delay recognition of failure of the SIM product. We're not avoiding or delaying the failure of the SIM product. We're avoiding or delaying the recognition of the fact that it failed. Nobody wants to own the failed project. As a result of that, we wind up spending more money and getting less for it than if we'd gone a different way initially. So when I first wrote this presentation uh, a couple of years ago, this is where it ended. But what I've really seen in the last few years is there's a new model that's coming out. Um, so depending on where you are in the uh, kind of budget side and security focus side, for smaller, less security focused organizations, this choice is really a binary. I don't have the money or the staff resources to do both. I've got to either pick a SIM and, and go with it, or I've got to hire an MSSP and, and invest in that model. For organizations that have significant budget and significant security staff, though, what we're seeing is a move to a new model. We're going to talk about coexistence between SIMs and MSSP. So if we think about it, the strengths of a SIM is I control it internally. My data is here. I have direct access to it. And I have a huge amount of flexibility. It's, it's a piece of software. I can modify it any way I want. Some challenges, we talked about the operational difficulties, tuning and monitoring and retention of staff. On the MSSP side, the strengths were repeatable processes. Uh, the onboarding process, the tuning, first tier event, event review, the fact that I get threat analysis, uh, threat intelligence with it, and access to the subject matter experts within the MSSP. Challenges on the MSSP is loss of control, right? I'm, I'm giving all this to somebody else, and a certain amount of inflexibility. Uh, in fact, uh, MSSPs really vary. Uh, the worst of them, I would say, on the loss of control side, function like a black box. Logs go in, alerts come out, I have no visibility whatsoever to what's happening inside of there. Now, some SS MSSPs give you better visibility, but that is still a challenge. It's not the same as doing it yourself, right? There's a certain amount of loss of control. So, what we find is, a good way to do this is to do it as a split function. I can use my MSSP for my highest analysis value of devices, the subset of devices that give the best intel, and use it as my alarm system. I can use a SIM for either the remaining devices or everything, and use it primarily for post hoc forensics and data mining. Okay? Some advantages of this approach, I'm using my MSSP to reduce um, my SIM costs and staffing challenges. I'm using the SIM to make sure my MSSP is doing the job for me well. I've got a, an alternate system to validate that uh, they're catching the things they should be and doing the job effectively. Um, I can use it for data mining. Um, if 
the MSSP is not working out and I need to make a vendor change, I've got an internal system that I can kind of limp along with to make the, the transition period. And that's it. So again, I just want to reiterate the point. In smaller, uh, let's say tighter budget companies, where I've spent a lot of my career, um, you really don't have that choice of the, of the belt and suspenders, right? Um, when that's the case, I would argue that the MSSP is the way to go because that alerting function is so important and it's hard to maintain it operationally uh, with a SIM tool. Um, if you are in the situation of having a large organization, more budget, more flexibility, that dual approach strategy we're finding is, is really the best way to go. Any questions? Yes. Um, you know, for example, Target, they had one mm -hmm. where it was sent, but no one responded. Mm -hmm. How do you mitigate against that? Because you still have the operational challenge of having someone responsible and using judgment to, uh, you know, investigate what the MSSP is providing. That's a really good question. So the target breach is the problem of signal to noise. Right? They were drowning in information. They had many, many different systems feeding them. And as a result, um, actually I saw a great uh, Nova about um, uh, information overload. And they interviewed um, uh, fighter pilots from the Vietnam era. And one of the fighter pilots had been shot down because he was getting so much information from his console that the warning that there was a missile fired at him, like he just couldn't process it. He wound up as a prisoner of war. Uh, and he said when he, when he was released, he listened to the tapes and heard the ground uh, control people telling him there's a missile coming at you. But he was so bombarded with information, he couldn't, he couldn't take it in. Same thing happens in our information security groups, is that we've got all these different technologies, all these different service providers uh, sending us information. And our ability to process it and benefit from it really gets buried in that. So what I would say is consolidating that. I mean, we often use the term single pane of glass, right? Getting that information um, to a first tier analysis that allows the important things to come through for kind of second tier internal response um, is is our approach. Uh, you know, at the MSSP where I work, um, and so consolidating as many feeds as possible so that the internal staff is not drowning in information. Did, did that answer your question? Okay. Yes. Sure. Um, in our industry, there are no guarantees. Uh, I actually heard the joke, the best we can do is not fail, right? Um, I remember uh, long ago, uh, before they were acquired, um, ISS's old uh, security monitoring group uh, advertised this big thing where they had uh, insurance for, for cyber events. Uh, they would pay you $50,000 if you had a serious breach. Of course, they charged you $50,000 for the policy. So <laughs> kind of questionable what you got for it. Um, that to me, if you're in a situation to be able to afford to do it, is one of the arguments for the, the SIM and MSSP together approach. Um, for most organizations, that's not really an affordable option. And so what I would say is just um, kind of staying on top of your MSSP, validating, uh, you know, in the initial selection process that they have good, uh, both good tools and good processes. Um, just, you know, vet it as well as you can, be as engaged as you can with them. In our industry, there are no guarantees. There's no technology you can buy, no service that you can buy that says, I will never miss an incident. All we can do is ongoing diligence and, and you know, oversight. So it's a lousy answer. It's the best answer there is that I've, that I've seen. Well, thank you for your attention today, and have a good uh, rest of the conference. <laughs> <laughs>